I think that there's a really strong likelihood that we see, I think the SEC gets denied their motion for summary judgment as written for sure. I'm, you know, very confident in saying that, but that doesn't mean I'm confident that Ripple is going to win. In today's video, attorney John Deaton discussed the latest with the SEC Ripple XRP lawsuit. The recent summary judgments from Ripple and the SEC, and what's next for the procedural process, likelihood of a settlement soon. Today is the fifth anniversary of the most, in my opinion, arguably the most infamous speech ever given by a uh, senior director or official from the SEC, Bill Hinman former director of corporation finance gave his infamous June 14th, 2018 speech that declared Ethereum, although it started as a security, is no longer a security, very big market moving news. And the emails that were just unsealed, that were fought for for two and a half years, seven court orders, emails that were going to shock us or that were well worth it. All of those things got released. We're here to talk about it. And my first thoughts are this. The emails have been described by some as a nothing burger. They've been described as some as pure proof of corruption and all of this. The reality is it depends on your perspective. Right. If you were anti ripple, anti XRP, it's a nothing burger. If in fact you are an XRP holder, it's validation of everything that you knew was transpiring behind the scenes sort of got validated. I will believe it's validation. I do believe that because crypto law put a video library out together that kind of documented all these events and we demonstrated what we believed uh, was taking place behind the scenes. And in fact, these emails, these speech drafts absolutely prove that. Uh, a Coindesk article just came out discussing XRP holders and the fight that we've been engaged in for, for years. I want to set the, the stage, though, for people to understand this, this speech. On December 13th, 2017, that's when Hinman met with Consensus and Joe Lubin and, you know, the ETH founders, and he was represented and Consensus was represented by Jay Clayton's firm, Sullivan and Cromwell. And they got these meetings and those meetings continued for months and months leading up to the speech. In January, Jay Clayton gave a speech and he went to Chris Dixon at A16Z and they discussed what these market participants wanted. And Jay Clayton said, put together a memo and give it to Bill Hinman. And that memo, right? There was more meetings after that, but that memo was dated March 26, 2018 by Perkins Cooey. I have a, that's the infamous, infamous memo there. This working group, which was of ETH investors primarily, put together a memo and gave it to Bill Hinman. Two days later, they had a meeting about that memo and what they were asking. And that, that memo, basically, you see it as it appears in the speeches. May 3rd was the first time we see that there is a draft of the speech. Okay, and that, look what it's titled, May 3rd. When does a security stop being a security? You're going to learn that this was all about the acceptance that ETH started as an ICO, a pure securities offering. In fact, later on uh, in that same document, it says ETH clearly started off as a security. Pure ICO right there, clearly began a securities offering because it's an ICO. There was no uh, foundation. There was no uh, network yet, no blockchain. They raised the money and they built it. So everyone's agrees an ICO, a pure ICO, is a securities offering. And so then we see another rendition of the speech on May 24th. And that's when we see the first real speech. And guess what? Words that were used in that Perkins Cooey memo appear verbatim. Words like, um, I have it written down, um, uh, irrational exuberance, right? That's something odd. 
That was in the Perkins Coie memo that shows up in the initial draft. Something that I believe in, the token itself is not a security. That's in the Perkins Coie memo that ends up in the first draft and in the final draft. And so the bottom line is the ETH investors who met with Bill Hinman, their memo, it tracks his speech. And then finally on June 4th, um, remember that first title I just showed you, when does the security stop being a security? Bill Hinman called it something different. He called it the Ether speech. Notice in the speech, he talks about Bitcoin and ETH, but he doesn't call it the Bitcoin and ETH speech. He calls it the Ether speech. And what we learned from the emails finally was that Hinman was not following the law. His own people, Director of Trading Markets, Office of General Counsel, were saying, stick to Howie. Stick to Howie, stick to the law. You're bringing up new factors, sufficient decentralization, asymmetries, things of this nature that they're saying, hey, leave that stuff out. But Bill Hinman kept it. He included actual elements and points that the Office of General Counsel said are irrelevant, but he wanted it. And those things, of course, were something like, if a group owns a substantial amount of the tokens, and they're motivated to increase the value. Bill Hinman said, that's important. The director, the Office of General Counsel said, not so much. Now, why would Bill, why would Brad Garlinghouse say that's shocking? Because you can see the roadmap where Ripple's being targeted and ETH is getting it passed. I got to tell you, we see the SEC and senior personnel, including Gary Gensler, refusing to talk about specific platforms, tokens. It was the way it was before the speech, and it's been the way it is ever since the speech. And when you say something as market moving as ETH is not a security and, and give that kind of regulatory clarity, I got to believe that would be normally the SEC ethics office would be involved. A lot of XRP holders were thinking that maybe someone would have emailed and with these draft speeches, what about XRP? or, you know, and took that kind of, not necessarily fought for it, but just inquired about it. And, and to my knowledge, there is no discussion like that. Uh, but at the same time, there was a memo that was, and I know you're aware of it, it's June 13th, 2018, where enforcement lawyers like yourselves analyzed XRP and ripple cells of XRP under the Howey test. The judge ruled that privileged. Now, but the judge, Netburn, Mark, she noted that there was no recommendation ever made at the conclusion of that memo that she read in camera. And, and you could correct me if I'm wrong or, or disagree with me. I've taken the position that by inference that had the XR, uh, had the enforcement officer said, boy, XRP is clearly a security, there would have been at least a tell Ripple to stop, like cease and desist letter recommendation of enforcement, something you wouldn't go another, you know, basically two and a half years before you bring an enforcement action. Um, Bill Hinman's last day at the SEC was December 4th. And there was a rumored settlement by that was talks were going on. Brad Garlinghouse and others have talked about it. Bill Hinman came back after he left, even though he had already left and got involved in a meeting and, and there was ended up being no settlement. Now, I wasn't there. I can't speculate what was said. I just know it's a matter of record that he left and came back and got involved when, you know, even after he had left the SEC. And, and so when you add all these up, it just starts, you know, at some point you see so much smoke that you got to believe there's a fire there. That's all. Now, there was a lot more documents that were unsealed other than the Hinman emails that are honestly more important. And I know a lot of people might be surprised by that, but the Hinman emails are not, as both of you said, it doesn't go to the underlying issue, which was did Ripple sell XRP that constituted an unregistered offering or sell? And, and that's really what it comes down to. And so uh, we know all the evidence that uh, Ripple's targeting the SEC and the Hinman and the conflicts and that. But I want to turn to the SEC's case, underlying substantive case against Ripple, because 
one thing that Jeremy and I both shared when people would always ask us, John, uh, Jeremy, is there going to, is the SEC going to win? Is Ripple going to win? You know, and I have publicly said that this overarching theory that XRP is a security despite the seller or the circumstance surrounding the sell, I believe the judge will reject that theory. Uh, whether or not she finds specific evidence, we didn't get to see the exhibits. And I want to share a, a few thoughts to the audience because we've learned some of that. And before I, I talk about the case against Ripple and the SEC's chances, I think it's important to point out that we're living in an age of Celsius and FTX, you know, Sam Bankman fraud, Luna, UST, fraud cases that have happened. Ripple was investigated for two and a half years prior to this enforcement action. And after a two and a half year investigation, they were not charged with fraud. They were not charged with uh, misrepresentation, omission, or any of that. As a former federal prosecutor, I want on record to say, if I could had a good faith basis to bring a charge case in addition to an underlying Section 5 case, I would have, you know, just as a matter of course. And so I don't know how many crypto companies today or in the years past could survive two and a half years and not one single count of fraud be alleged. So I throw that out there, but that doesn't mean Ripple didn't do some stuff, right? That doesn't mean that there isn't a potential valid claim uh, for a securities violation. So what I wanna do is, I, I believe this is the heart of the SCC's case. And that is that uh, where they claim Ripple uh, engaged in domestic efforts to foster US investor appetite for XRP including offering incentives and paying exchanges to list XRP, you know, saying here's $1 million to, I believe, Kraken. Here's $5 million to Coinbase as, as incentive to list this token, um, uh, their website. So I'm just going to real quickly go through a few pieces of evidence because I want you all, you both of you to weigh in on its strength or its weaknesses. Let's first pull up. 583. Now, these, this is just an email where an investor reaches out to Ripple saying, you know, talking about acquiring XRP in a large amount. And this is presumably an accredited investor who has a, a, a fund, a hedge fund. And Ripple responds and tells them how they can. Let's go to 584. We're going to do this quickly. Another email right about over the counter and what's the easiest way to buy xrp these are emails ripples getting back in 2016 or seven or even earlier here's another one uh where uh, one ripple employee says to another ripple employee what do i do when i get these calls and it says i would direct them to how to buy xrp page that's on our website let's go to the next one here are basically chats between ripple employees talking about you know, the difficulty in New York for New Yorkers to acquire XRP. Uh, and they're discussing it. that this is evidence that the SCC is is pounding to the judge. Now, of course, Ripple is saying, look how transparent we are. And I say no good deed goes unpunished. Right. Because all of that is evidence now that the SCC is saying, look, Ripple, you're out there promoting it. And there are deposition testimony. I want people to know this of Brad Gardinghouse, Miguel Valles, where they're talking about how Ripple needs to establish liquidity for their ODL project, right? If you're gonna use ODL, on-demand liquidity, you've gotta have liquidity in the market. So Ripple is taking steps to make sure that happens. So it, you need to get XRP on Coinbase. You need to get XRP on multiple exchanges around the world so that they can access that on-demand liquidity, make their cross-border transactions using XRP as a bridge of different fiat currencies in three to five seconds. And so the only way to do that is to make efforts to drive the ecosystem and liquidity. And so Ripple did offer incentives. I know others have as well, but that was what's going on in the market. And so the XR, so basically uh, Ripple offered a rebate to Coinbase. 
we'll give you a, a minimum amount. We'll guarantee a minimum amount of uh, vo trading volume. Uh, we'll give you a discount at the, you know, things of that nature to basically drive that liquidity. And so Ripple, they cite Ripple. Uh, Ripple had a, a tweeted out a, uh, a petition to, they saw a petition uh, that was out there for XRP holders wanted Coinbase to list XRP. Ripple retweeted it. That's evidence in the case, right? That they're being used against them. There was an internal uh, employees discussed the online petition to uh, to get XRP. XRP Army is mentioned internally. There was a message by one Ripple employee that says, boy, it's really great to have an army out there that says things that we probably shouldn't say as a company, right? All of that is is evidence. Um, I've seen SEC enforcement lawyers and heard them read the, the Ripple complaint that the SEC filed and said it's a slam dunk and it's a great case. When I read it, I saw a lot of noise, you know, like they use non-fraud language and I mean, fraud like language in a non-fraud complaint. And it just had a lot of what I consider noise in it. And I never viewed it as that great of a, a, a complaint. You know, I thought it was overbroad that, you know, XRP holders are all in a common enterprise with each other around the world and Ripple, the theory that the entire XRP ecosystem, that we're in a common enterprise with exchanges and each other and Ripple. I believe a lot of people focus on the sales, but I want to remind the audience that an unregistered offering is enough. It doesn't have to actually be a sell. We do want to say, because I call it like it, when someone asks me, you know, and it sort of goes to Jeremy's, you know, um, so red flag, you know, where little things. Someone asked me, John, what's the what's the worst case or the evidence against Ripple? It would be what you talked about, because when you compound, when you compare uh, software sales to XRP sales, you're going to see like 40 million versus one billion. Right. Like. This is how much money they make in revenue for their software to banks or financial institutions. This is how much money they've generated from XRP sales. The, I would push back on the speculative thing. It's a it's a pet peeve of mine, Mark. Uh, when you read the Howey case, the Howey court says right after the test that whether or not the nature of the instrument is speculative in nature, it's, it's immaterial. And and the whether and it also says whether the underlying asset has intrinsic value is irrelevant. And those are two big factors that that SEC folks and Gary Gensler f focus on. They focus on speculation and 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 the tokens don't have intrinsic value. I, I would point out too, you know, and this could just be boilerplate that the judge used, but when she when she unsealed the documents, she did say. Quote, whether or not I rule the Hinman doc emails are admissible, implying that's for another day. Now, obviously, she'd only be ruling on the admissibility if there was a jury. And uh, and I've always said that people underestimated the chances of a jury, uh, whether it's to the common enterprise prong that I talked about, whether it is to the reasonable expectation of profit. I mean, it's hard to be in a common enterprise or rely on the efforts of a company that you are oblivious exists. You know, I can tell you when many XRP holders, they just bought XRP because it was the third largest crypto and it was cheaper than Bitcoin. I mean, let's just be honest. That's a fact. Uh, my daughter was one of them who just said, you know, I'm buying a Bitcoin and, a, and splitting five grand and buying half of ETH and XRP because I hear my dad talk about this this new asset class. She'd never heard of, you know, even Vitalik Buterin or Satoshi Nakamoto and let alone Brad Garlinghouse or Ripple. And so um, I agree with you. I, I think that there's a really strong likelihood that we see, I think the SEC gets denied their motion for summary judgment as written for sure. I'm, you know, very confident in saying that, but that doesn't mean I'm confident that Ripple is going to win. I could see their summary judgment being denied and she leaves at least one or two triable issues you issues out there because I don't see enough specific transaction evidence that that's in there that 
unless you're just going to go with the offering, like like Ripple offered this token in general as a via, Section 5 violation. 